Okay, I'm back in. Travis is here. Hi, Travis. Hello. So I hope people are coming back in. Um, sorry about this. I, I didn't do anything. Bob didn't do anything. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was Bob because I can't even end his meeting, but uh, I it must have been me, but I'm not I really don't know what I did. I had my head. You got too excited. Okay, guys, have a fun class, Bob. Um you have your you you have access to the slides. Yeah, yeah, I'm all set up. Okay, all right, great. Thanks. Yeah. Hey guys, um I, I know that's a little grueling of you know to get us hooked up here. Um, I think it would be worthwhile to just get through chapter one a little bit um, because it's more of a, a vague general introduction to the world of accounting. And then when we get to chapter uh, two on Thursday, we can have a review of chapter one and then get into chapter two. And it's chapter three where we really start talking the language of accounting. So let's spend a little bit of time here and you, you interrupt with questions you may have. And I am going to share a screen. And my first question is, can you see this? Can you see the uh, slides? Okay, we can see the slides, huh? That's a good start. And I try to make it a little big, bigger if I can. Okay, you let me know if the slides disappear. We've had a little bit of uh, trouble with this. <clears throat> but intro to accounting. Here, we're, we're going to get into this course, you're pretty much going to be working as a service company or a merchandise company, like a store. The purpose of accounting. Oh, my goodness. The purpose of accounting. Provide information about the current operation and the financial condition. Nobody can, no business can exist of any size without proper audited accounting statements. If you want to borrow money from a bank, you cannot do it without properly prepared financial statements, a balance sheet, an income statement, a statement of equity, and a few other things. So the purpose of accounting is to disseminate the information to the users of that information. Now, who wants to see a company's financial statements? Well, like that little problem that Cornelia did for us successfully, we um, have the owners of the business. Of course, the owners want to know what's going on. Are we making money? Are we profitable? What's our current position? And as a result of this information, owners may consider more investments. They may grow. If business is going poorly, they may want to try to find out what they can do to turn things around. And that will begin by looking at the financial statements. Managers, managers, line managers, certainly want to know the detail. I believe, Travis, you said you're in marketing. The marketing guys where I worked, you know, for many, many years, they were the first ones to grab onto the financial statements because their bonuses were based on sales. They wanted to know if they were meeting uh, deadlines. So yeah, ma the managers, the, the production manager, the purchasing manager, the marketing people, they need to know what the financial statements look like to make certain operating decisions. A financial statement might indicate which products are profitable, which are not. You can make decisions. Creditors are people who loan you money. Loan you money. No one's going to loan you money without properly prepared financial statements. So you want to go to a, a bank or you want to go to a a potential supplier, and you say, um, I want to buy a million dollars worth of your product. First thing they're going to do is say, okay, give me a million in cash and I'll ship. And you say, well, you know, I want to get credit. Well, they're not going to give you 30 day credit terms until they look at your financial statement. And then the government, like Cornelia said, they want to make sure you're paying proper taxes. So you send in your tax information, you pay your tax tax bill, and you may be audited by the IRS. They're going to come in and they're going to have the legal right to demand to look at your financial statements 
and they'll do their own calculation whether you paid your taxes. So users of accounting information are all over the place. Another set of people they did not mention here, investors, investors. Investors are not going to buy a stock in a company unless they know something about its financial condition. So there are a lot of uses of accounting information. And if I may babble a little more, potential employees, you make an offer, a nice offer to somebody to come work for you. You know, maybe that person's going to look at your financial statement and say, oh, this place is going down the tubes. I'm going to go elsewhere. So the point is a lot of users of the accounting information. Now, this part here, I think is kind of a little dreadful, to be honest with you, but they're just giving you a sense of the what they call the process. Accounting, you're gathering in financial information about a business and reporting it, this information to users in the form of financial statements. So analyzing, they're, they're giving you steps here. And I, I would like you to look at this screen right here when you're doing your homework, because I'm gonna give you a, a little hint on the test. They like to give a couple of these out. They like to ask you the order of things um, so let's just go over them uh, rather briefly here. Steps in the process, analyzing, looking at events that have taken place and how they affect. It could be as simple as you're sitting, you're the accounting guy and you're sitting at your desk and you open up the mail and there's the electric bill. Okay, well, you can say you have to analyze the electric bill. You analyze it by looking at it and you know, look, make sure it's reasonable, you know, and then once you say, okay, that looks like our electric bill, all right, and it's in the ballpark, then you're ready to, to go and record that. You're now going to go into your system, whether it's a manual system or it's QuickBooks or whatever, and you're going to record it. You're going to enter it into your counting system, and you're going to do it in a way by classifying it into the proper area. And at the end of the period, you're going to summarize things and then you're going to report the numbers and you're going to use tables of numbers or whatever. You're gonna repair the financial statements. Let's call it what it is, telling the results, prepare the financial statements, and then probably as important as anything, interpreting those financial statements. And where I worked, where I worked for a long time in downtown Los Angeles, there was a, a letter, excuse me here, guys, I, I distracted myself. Okay. Are you are you guys still there? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll yeah. I'll keep going here. I I lost the screen. Hold on one second. Give me one moment here. Okay, give me just a moment. I don't know why this thing's playing games on me. Okay, we've come back, huh? Okay. So we, we were just talking about the accounting process. And I was about to say, where I worked for a lot of, a, long, a number of years, I was mostly a controller in manufacturing companies. And at the end of the month, I had to put out a letter interpreting, if you will, the financial statements. Sales for this month were a million. We were expecting two million. Here's what went wrong. Here's what we're going to do. So your steps, analyzing, recording, classifying. Gap, generally accepted accounting practices. Generally accepted accounting practices principles, I think, would be okay, acceptable as well. Gap. Gap, generally accepted accounting principles. Gap represents the rules of accounting. Gap is the Bible, if you will, that tells the world how these transactions are recorded. For example, you're going to learn that we're in, a, in an environment, we're going to be doing accrual, it's called accrual-based accounting. And under gap accounting, cruel based, when you sell your product, 
That's the point where you record the income. It has nothing to do with the cash. The cash may come two months later. The point is when you sell the product, you have recorded a sale. That's just an example of one of the many, many gap rules. And those rules are devised by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. That's a unit of the CPAs, the American Institute of CPAs, and the FASB and GAP and all of this, much of this began in 1934 during the Great Depression when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president and realized that the statements on the stock exchanges in those days could be totally bogus. Generally accepted accounting principles developed by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And I think you need to know those two acronyms because you'll be hearing them. And these are the procedures and guidelines to be followed. And I'm not gonna get too much into this, the process used by FASB. They identify an issue, they put it on the agenda, they research, they do preliminary hold. Holy cow, this sounds kind of boring and overblown, I think. But I just want to give you an example of it, give you a flavor of what we're talking about. For many, many years, big stores, Nordstrom's, Macy's, whoever, would sell gift cards. And a certain amount of gift cards are never used. So that would be like free income, if you would, to Macy's. They knew that not everybody was going to use their gift cards. But the accounting people thought we, they should at least recognize somehow that people are not going to use these things. So the issue was what to do with gift cards. They put it on the agenda. And now companies are required to estimate the amount of gift cards that will not be used and record it. So that's kind of, I think, kind of an interesting little issue that FASB addressed. There, there are so many others. Learning objective four, three types of business, three types of business. I hope you all take Bonnie Chavez's um, intro to business class where he gets into great detail here. But what are we talking about? A sole proprietorship. That's a fellow opens up a business, a man or a woman opens up a business and they are the boss. They do everything. They hire whoever they want. They fire whoever they want. They decide what they're going to make, how much they're going to charge for it. A sole proprietorship, very easy to start, a lot of, a lot of risk. Partnership, two or more people, a uh, certain amount of risk there. Corporation is a publicly held company owned by stockholders. Sole proprietorship, one owner. Owner assumes all risk, makes all decisions. Please understand, if you don't know, and I bet, I bet a lot of you do know this, if you are a sole proprietor, let's say you open up your business with a $10,000 investment of your own money, and your business works for a while, and then it goes bad, and you find yourself in a position where you're bankrupt, sadly, and now you owe $1 million, just to really exaggerate it. You are now responsible for that whole one million dollars. So that's the when we say assumes all risk. Yeah, yeah. It's not just your ten thousand dollars that it's at risk. It's whatever debts accumulate that you can't handle. Sole proprietorship. That is the biggest number of businesses in this country. Small businesses. You're always hearing we must give tax help and breaks to small business. Sole proprietors, partners, two or more partners shared risks and they too unless there are certain kind of partnerships that'll ameliorate risk but for the most part if an, if a partnership goes south the partners are each liable for any losses above their initial investment and you might find this interesting um partnerships are typically what you see in accounting firms the idea was many years ago, you set yourself up as an, as an auditor, like Arthur Anderson used to be, or Deloitte Touche now, or whoever. And you were proud to say that you're a partnership 
And I think the implication was you were not worried about having to uh, go out of business and incur losses. You're telling the world we're confident in what we're doing here. We're not hiding behind corporate privilege. And of course, if two partners disagree, oh my goodness, there's so many television shows about partners murdering each other. You know, I like that show Law and Order and <laughs> half the shows are about partners shooting each other. I'm exaggerating, being a little bit silly, but you get the point. Corporations, now here we go, owned by stockholders, owned by stockholders. You start a company, you announce to the world that you're selling a million shares of your stock and you, you raise X amount of dollars, that's the worth of the company. Then if the company goes bankrupt, you as the company, any executives of the company have limited risk. You cannot be sued for debts beyond anything that the company's incurred. In other words, you have what's called the corporate shield. If you run a company as a corporate executive and you're terrible at it and you go bankrupt and your company owes the world millions and millions and millions of dollars, you are not personally responsible for it. It brings to mind a certain president uh, you might be thinking about. Stockholders may have little influence though on the business decision. I own 100 shares of Coca-Cola. Technically, that makes me a part owner of Coca-Cola. I own 0.001% of that company. So my vote doesn't have much influence, but I am an owner. Corporation. Different types of business activities. Service businesses, merchandising, manufacturing. We're in this class here, guys, we're going to be doing service and merchandising a service business oh, let me get out of this i'm sorry service business is just that there's no physical product necessarily involved you're an architect a doctor a lawyer a travel agency like they're showing you here a computer uh, consultant you provide a service you go to somebody's house and you clean their house that's a service business, service. Merchandising, by this definition, you're buying a product and then hoping to sell it to an end user for obviously more than you paid for it. And we know what merchandising is, you know, department stores, pharmacies like they have here, grocery stores, bookstores. You buy something for $10 and hopefully sell it for 20, huh? In accounting 110, it's going to be a lot of service business and a lot of merchandising. In accounting 230, um, which is called um, financial accounting, you're going to get real heavily involved in the merchandising world. Manufacturing business, this is our course, accounting 240, a business that makes a product to sell, cars, furniture, toys, pe people like that. And that's where I work. Um, nearly most of my career till I, till I ended up in Santa Barbara 20 years ago. Manufacturing. We're not going to be involved in a manufacturing environment here. Just know service, merchandising, and manufacturing are three broad strokes. And we'll end this chapter here by briefly going through these last few grids where they just talk about you know, you graduate with a you know degree in accounting or you're taking some courses like you guys are at City College, or you're looking for your AAS degree, or you're in the workforce, they're talking about things like accounting clerks. These are, you know, lower paid people, probably. They record and file information. Uh, accounting clerk typically might be an accounts receivable clerk, accounts payable, involved with a small part of the total accounting responsibilities. Not to say that many, many accounting clerks I've seen over the years have risen to become my boss. A lot of opportunities, just getting just getting your foot in the door. Bookkeepers, more responsibility than a clerk. They'll probably supervise the clerks. They'll do some of the daily accounting work. They'll do some of the summarizing. But you can see you need a couple of years of accounting education, maybe some experience. And perhaps some of you want to get your bookkeeper's certificate from the school. Be a great thing to have. 
para accountants. I never even heard of this. I like, came to the school here about 10 years ago, but it's akin to a, a paralegal, a little higher level of work. Ah, here we go. Accounting, accountants. Well, they don't just record the numbers and hand out statements. They might design the accounting information system itself. How are we going to handle our cash? How are we going to handle customer relations in terms of, of the monies? So the accounting guys, they go well beyond just recording. They're designing, they're analyzing, interpreting. They're looking for trends in the data. Hey, what's going on here? Our sales have gone from a million to 900,000, 800. Whoa, let's put the brakes on. What's going on? And you study the impact of alternative decisions. When you get into accounting 240, this I think is the most interesting part of accounting 240. You get into a situation where you might be talking about a factory, about a manufacturing company with three uh, producing plants around the United States and they're thinking of closing one because it's losing business, losing money rather. It seems simple to say close it, it's losing money. But what you're going to learn is closing it may cause you to really lose a lot more money. So a lot of alternatives. And you normally have a degree if you call yourself an accountant. You like to work in public accounting? Public accounting. These are the auditors. These are your CPA firms. These are the people when you drive around town, you might see a shingle out on a lawn. Joe Smith, CPA, hours eight until, until six. Public accounting, these are the men and women who audit financial statements. A company cannot be listed on the stock exchange without audited financial statements, meaning that they've been blessed by external auditors. And it's the same thing with the creditors. They're not going to loan you money unless the stuff is audited. Private accounting, that's what I did. I worked for a couple of companies. Uh, private. We were, uh, I worked with a company called Thomas and Betts for many years, manufacturer. Private has nothing to do with dealing with the public. You're working with within the company. And then you have a lot of opportunities in government and not for profit accounting. A good, good friend of mine, he just retired after like 40 something years with the general accounting, off, accounting office in Washington, D.C. And he had a great job there for many, many years. Government accounting, that could be for someone. And I'm going to point something else out here briefly. Not-for-profit accounting, nonprofit organizations. When I ended up in Santa Barbara here, I somehow ended up as the chief financial officer of the Santa Barbara neighborhood clinics in town here. I bet some of you are familiar with, with, with our locations. I was there when we built the new clinic on the east side, the new dental clinic, when we moved the uh, old east side clinic over there next to the cow on the intersection of, um, what is it, Kenya Perdido and Milpas. Nonprofit accounting. These are the charitable places. A lot of opportunity, especially in the Santa Barbara area. And Colby Sullivan, one of our professors, now teaches a great course just in that area. Public accounting, like I said, auditing, they might do taxes. You might hire a public accounting firm just to look at how you're doing things financially. And then here's a good one, forensic accounting. Companies are looking to find out if anybody's trying to steal from them. Um, you know, forensic guys come in and they try to determine if there's some fraud or bad procedures. And the good old CPA certificate, you're a CPA, certified public accountant. That means you have a certain amount of work experience, you have a certain level of education, and most importantly, you have passed the grueling, tough CPA exam. Private, you're working for your own company. You're working for a company. Your boss is telling you what to do, and you do a lot of these different things. You might be doing budgeting. I did a lot of budgeting. You might have internal auditors, controller, that was me, principal accounting officer, I wasn't the vice president necessarily, but I was pretty much the operations guy, controller. And you might get a degree in certified management accounting, 
which is uh, like 240, or the Certified Internal Auditor, governmental, governmental, all kinds of state jobs, federal jobs. Um, the, the accounting rules are different when you're talking government, and we don't really go into that at all here. And I'm not even going to bother to blow these things up, but they're just they're just giving you a graph that there's a lot of demand for accounting people. It typically is known as the the major where you can get a job, huh? And we just talked about an accounting clerk. According to this book, they will earn thirty seven thousand dollars a year on average. I'm not sure those numbers are correct, but this is published by um, the. Uh, Actually, I don't know who it's published by. They're calling it the U.S. National Averages. Somebody has done these studies. A bookkeeper averages about 41000 a year. Budget analyst, 55. Here's a good one. Accounts payable manager, 83450 Boy, that's not bad just for running accounts payable. But that is an important job, believe me. Audit executives, 215. Wow, look at all this money. Controller, 188,000. Hey, they didn't pay me that when I was working for many years, but controller, a little higher level job. And I guess that's the end of our slides. So what we've done is just had a brief introduction into chapter one. On Thursday, I'll go through this even more rapidly with the anticipation we'll hit chapter two pretty hard and get into some actual um, work like that. Does um, anybody have any uh, questions? Nope. Any comments? Okay, I'll let you go. By the way, I always end up my meetings these days. The New York Jets stink. Anybody a football fan here knows what I'm talking about. Holy cow, my buddies back in New Jersey are dying. They are horrendous. <laughs> okay, guys, I will let you go. So glad that you were able to join us today, and we will see you on Thursday, okay? Thank you very much. Hey, bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.